via telephone, our uh, guest as well, Senate President Craig Blair. Good morning, Craig. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you all today? Good morning, Mr. President. We are, we are quite well, sir. We are quite well. Uh, let's see here, Craig. Let's start first with the obvious, and that is the progress with tax cuts in the state of West Virginia. Where does that sit? Well, right now, we're still calling through. Uh, you know, we understand what they sent us for the tax bill. Uh, the problem with it is, is that uh, I, I asked two weeks ago, and I asked a, a week ago, and yesterday we finally had a meeting again and uh, said, you know, you guys uh, have to prioritize the spending. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of spending. I can, if you'd like, I know it's boring to hear this yeah, stuff, go. but pay raises, $115 million, another $60 million uh, with the, the liabilities for the pensions, $40 million for PEIA, the teachers age 37. Now, this is all base building. Uh, and you, that $37 uh, million is multiplied by three because it increases for three years in a row. So that'll end up being $100 million. There's another $20 million for nursing, uh, $13 million for tourism. The list goes on and on. Now, that's just the base build. When it comes to one-time spends, uh, there's $125 million for the consolidated lab. That's actually $250 million. Uh, $115 million for the civil contingent fund. That's the governor's fund. I have no idea. Even we, We're still trying to figure that one out, unless it's... Uh, that's $115 million. It's probably a no-go uh, in the Senate. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, economic development project of uh, transfer, another $110 million. Do you get the hint here on what I'm getting at? Uh, that uh, you, if you're going to do tax cuts, you still got to be able to control the spending. And I don't think anybody that listened to the governor stay the state didn't realize that he spent a billion dollars more than what it was like Christmas morning. Uh, and if you're going to do tax cuts, you got to be able to control your spending. Otherwise, it won't work. And so the, the Senate, we've uh, went through and prioritized our spending. We've got in our caucus time no less than six hours of managing that side of it. And so we're going to factor that in. And then we're going to offer up what we believe that we can do for the uh, tax uh, reform in the state of West Virginia. And remember, we wanted to do tax reform uh, before. And I'm talking about personal income tax. Uh, and then we realized that it was clearly a better path to eliminate 100% of a tax, and that was the personal property tax, rather than 50% uh, or 30% or 10% of another tax, like the personal income tax. But this is where we're at today. And, you know, your promo, uh, you prod me again. I know how you do it. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you had chairman or the uh, delegate householder of uh, saying that a 2% is a no-go. Well, if that's the way the game's played, well, then maybe – there's not going to be any tax reform because you got to be able to negotiate and be able to work with each other to get things done. But we'll see. In, in my defense, that's been running since the two were on earlier this week, it, and it typically runs throughout the week. So don't take it as a oh. personal shot to get you going with red meat here, Craig. Oh, darn. I, 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 the, the red Rob, meat. Let's be, let's, let's be honest, Rob. That's probably been running for the last two or three days. So hoping that you could get me wound up early for the show. Well, it, it, and then, then he has in reserve, uh, Craig, uh, Stubblefield and Ferretti. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, hey, I, I'm teasing anyhow. Uh, but I, I, I don't care. Uh, but it's, it makes it. You know, I'm trying to drive up the advertising. By the way, I've got a news announcement that I do need to make. Uh, and that it, I think your boss uh, likes it so well down here, he's going to actually run for governor. What do you think? All right, Governor Hornby. I like it. Does, <laughs> that, that means he'll move to Charleston, will he? It does, that's why I like it. <laughs> no, I, I'm telling you right now, you, if you're governor, you do not have to move to Charleston nowadays. <laughs> that's true. That's no longer a requirement. <laughs> <laughs> that is no longer a requirement. That is correct. Mr. Stubblefield, you're up next. Yeah, uh, Craig, uh, good morning. Uh, it's always good to talk to you. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, again, going with uh, personal income tax. Uh, the Senate, the uh, legislators 
have the ability of both uh, determine what is going to be spent on what items and how much. You also have the ability to look at tax reform, personal tax reform. Uh, you are on record of saying that if we do personal tax reform, uh, it should be at least 50%. And that's what the governor proposed and the House has endorsed. So it's to, to the Senate with what you have personally proposed we should do. Uh, the fact that uh, that uh, you do control the spending side of things, why would you not go ahead and go forward with the personal tax reform? Because it's going to be awful hard to, uh, income tax reform, sorry. It's going to be awful hard to explain to the residents of the, uh, the state of why you do not do something with tax reform. Great question. And we want to do something with tax reform. Here's the deal, though. Uh, you said that they're reducing it 50%. They are not. They're reducing it 30%, 10%, and 10%. So you've got three years there that it is not 50%. Okay? 50% brings economic activity. 10%, 20%, 30%, 40% do not. It only extracts money out of of our revenue stream that we could actually use for one-time uh, expenses like the labs that I was talking about, like roads, uh, infrastructure, broadband, water, sewer. The list goes on for that. Uh, and see, that you, we're, if you're going to reduce taxes and give money back, you want it to do it in such a way that you have economic activity. In the Eastern Panhandle, we're blessed. We're blessed with a, a strong, vibrant economy. You don't have to go very far at all to find in the state of West Virginia that that same type of economy does not exist. Imagine that going to a grocery store and your only choice within an hour is a Dollar General. Think about that for a minute. Now, we, we, and, un, we understand all this, Craig. But I'm not finished answering the question, <laughs> though, Bill. Okay? I was going to so rephrase I, it and make it much simpler. Uh, well, uh, okay, I'll go for it. <laughs> okay. Now, if we had, if, the, uh, if it was, uh, the bill said that there'd be 50% today and not the over the three-year period, 50% today, would you be supportive? Oh, I've, yes. And I was supportive last year like that, and they know that this year. Okay? If it's 50% uh, all at one time up front, and then we've got things in place to make it so that we do not go back and have to uh, take that 50% and make it 30% uh, three years from now, because the revenue projections that they've given, even Secretary Hardy, has said that the future governor and the future legislature of, I think it was in 2026, is going to have to come back and look at this because the numbers don't hold. And so we're going to put something in place uh, on the Senate side, hopefully, that the numbers can hold. But we're not going to be a Kansas. When uh, I was sitting at the table the other day uh, with uh, the House, the, uh, the governor's office, and the Senate, and uh, we were talking about this, we all three agreed that we do not want to end up being Kansas. And for your listeners, when we talk about Kansas, Kansas did uh, big tax reductions, and they couldn't control their spending. They nearly bankrupted their state. That is not what's going to happen in the state of West Virginia. We want to do this in a way when there's greater, greater economic activity, job opportunities to be able to keep our youth here and to grow the prosperity in this state. And if you do that and you have wage growth uh, and you're be able to spread it out, you can sustain the tax reduction. Does part of that sustainment include the 2% sales tax increase, Craig? No, that, nothing's off the table for that. Okay, the, the, the Senate has not put a proposal out yet. There's a whole host of ways to go be able to do it. Just understand that we're talking to tax experts. Okay, uh, the, the Senate was not included on any discussions on personal income tax reduction for months 
before the session, and then it was the, almost instantly that they passed that out of the House of Delegates. And you tell me how you gave it any thorough consideration on what you're going to do. And since then, again, Secretary Hardy has said it's unsustainable and that future legislatures and governors are going to have to be able to come back and readdress what's done. Look, the Senate is not interested in any short-term plan for tax reduction. It's going to have to be long-term. The Senate is not interested in funding uh, with governors or uh, state tax dollars a uh, governor's election bid to the U.S. Senate. Okay, now I know that that seems like it was uh, me throwing a, a bomb in, into this conversation, but that's really what it is. Okay, and, and so you you have to pay attention to that. Uh, the governor's flying around on the state plane right now, going from one place to another, campaigning for this. Is this is if I was governor, I would be working with the legislature, trying to be able to uh, work a, a, a doable plan that actually benefits the people of West Virginia, rather than saying that the, the Senate's got to do what we say it's going to do. We're not going to be bullied. That's not going to happen. Joe Ferretti. Craig, first of all, let me thank you for taking the time to speak with us here in the Eastern Panhandle this morning. I, I know you're a busy fellow. Everybody recognizes that. So thank you for that. Uh, let, let me, as I understand the House position on this, Craig, uh, they're willing to do 50 percent over the span of three years, as you indicated, 30 percent, then 10 percent, then 10 percent. But they also allow for contingencies in those later tax cuts that the state has to meet certain revenue projections in order for those additional tax cuts to 10 percent annually to go through so they're trying to be a little prudent they claim in how they're approaching this uh and they do that out of a conviction to not ever raise taxes in fact you you know this many of them signed pledges to never raise taxes so that's why they're saying that your the senate proposal is a non-starter isn't their approach being prudent enough that you would not worry about being a Kansas? No, it is not prudent enough. Again, we've got tax experts that's actually arguing the opposite on this. Now, everybody wants a tax reduction, and, you know, it's, it's great. You throw out there 50 percent. The governor tells everybody it's my idea. It is. If 50 percent all at one time. This is Economics 101, okay? And if you do 30%, you actually have no return on the investment in in your economy except for one thing. Uh, The people will spend the $300 million, or 30%. It's not $300 million. It's about $750 million. Uh, The people will spend that. But what happens with it is you collect 6% sales tax and maybe uh, get a little bit of overtime for some of the employees. But you're not going to create any economic activity to a greater degree from it. You get to 50% now. That's when things change, and it's well documented out here for that matter, uh, that you can actually change the dynamics. Businesses want to start locating in your state. Uh, It brings us into being the lowest income tax uh, in our surrounding states except for Pennsylvania, and they're just a little bit higher than what we – or a little bit lower than what we would be. Well, Craig, I understand the Senate's position is that we're going to be spending some money to take care of some problems that we have set aside for quite a while here in West Virginia. So, you know, perhaps on the table should be some sort of revenue enhancement, some sort of increase in the sales tax. Of all those things you listed earlier for us about things that we have to spend money on, the teacher's aides and PEIA and things like that, from your caucus's perspective, are there some must-dos some expenditures that you feel come hell or high water we have to do here in West Virginia this year. Absolutely, and uh, we've already passed some of those. Uh, we were working in advance of, in like the PEIA reimbursement increase, you got hospitals that are stopping, stopped accepting uh, PEIA. So that means their patients can't go there. Wheeling General is the first one. Other ones are talking about it off the record of uh, on that. So we passed that bill last year, and it was not taken up. 
uh, in the House of Delegates. We passed it again this year, and it cost $40 million to do that. And that's base building. That's every year that it will be $40 million. So you've got to extract that out of there. The teacher's aid legislation. Look, this is the speaker's idea, but the Senate ran it. Uh, and, and we work together, okay? And if you, it sounds like that we're at odds with each other by this conversation. We're not. This is a, a single issue. Uh, but the, that one will end up being $100 million out of the general revenue budget three years from now. You've got to factor that in. And by the way, that's already been passed uh, out of the Senate uh, and over to the House, and they're working it now. Uh, so there are things like that uh, that we have in place of uh, that, that, yes, uh, the, the Senate uh, is locked in uh, on some of those things. Hope Scholarship is another one uh, that it has an escalator, and by the time we get to 2026, it could be costing us over $100 million a year. This is our our argument from the Senate side, is, is that you got to look at this. I use the word holistically all the time, uh, but you got to take in the full view of what's going on. Just because you want to do tax reduction, uh, you, you've done all these other things that have additional expenses that come along with it and that, that will help our economy, that will help our people in West Virginia. But you've got to do it in such a way that you don't have to come back. And they're predicating uh, a lot of this on the revenues is on the, the severance tax, which is extremely high right now. Uh, and it. it on, from our perspective, it doesn't work the way it, uh, that they've sent it over to us, or we would have already passed it back. Yeah. Bill? Craig, um, I'm, I'm having some trouble following the logic. Uh, and before you throw many stones, I remember we have 20 years of friendship, so don't get too <laughs> angry with me up front. This is a dangerous <laughs> preamble, Bill. Yeah, that's a dangerous preamble. Uh, it's not easy to follow. <laughs> and, I get it. And, no, no, uh, you, I, but I'm looking for the simplest thing, the simplistic uh, answer. Uh, to me, it's hard to understand the difference between 50% cut in one year or 50% cut over three years. Uh, I realize there's a lot involved, but I come back to the fact there uh, there is some animosity may be too strong a word, but you do not, but the Senate and the uh, uh, Senate leadership and the governor are not on the best of terms. Uh, is this not just trying to uh, poke a finger in the eye of the governor? And why could no. you not just go with Absolutely with not. Okay. The, the, let me put that perfectly clear. Either to, to, This building is full of people that don't particularly like each other from time to time and yet become alliances when the, the, uh, what you need to do uh, is the proper thing. Okay? Just because uh, you've got personalities that don't mesh together uh, doesn't mean that you can't work together. Okay? Uh, think about it in the private sector as well. Uh, from that standpoint. So now they would like to paint that picture, okay? But it's not that way. In fact, the governor was sitting in my office the first time that he's been in this office uh, since he's been elected, whether it was Mitch Carmichael, Senate president, or myself, and it was a week ago or right <laughs> two hours before he, he announced he had COVID, okay? And, and, uh, and we talked about things. I frankly like the governor on the personal level, uh, but that is not going to change my, uh, in, the, in the Senate's perspective, where the board of directors for the people of West Virginia, and you make these decisions. This is not uncommon uh, for this to take place. What is uh, uncommon from years past is that uh, you got me on the radio, and we're talking about it, and uh, trying to negotiate it out. You guys are trying to get the scoop on what's going to happen next uh, on it, and I don't blame you. Uh, that's what you should be doing. But we haven't announced in the Senate. We're working on a plan A, a plan B, and then there's a plan C. And, it, and it'll be up to the House delegates and the governor to decide whether they like what we put forward or not. Okay? And that's the way it works. Senate President okay? Craig Blair is our guest here on the program. So, Craig, I have a uh, maybe we switch the dynamic here. If the... Governor's projections 
are questioned. As Senator Weld said, the math didn't seem to add up. And you pointed out in the beginning that the projections for the governor's wish list of spending also don't add up. And we agree the state has many needs, but we can't agree on how to do tax reform because we don't trust the numbers. And the numbers we have that are generating surpluses could be temporary, such as you cited with the extraction taxes. Then instead of doing tax reform, why don't we take this extra money and fix the things in the state that need fixed, like the infrastructure problems that m m many of the municipalities have around the state of West Virginia, the, the special education situation in the state of West Virginia, the foster care situation in West Virginia, and just take that money and spend it on things that need to be fixed. Just scrap the tax reform. We can't agree on it. D d d well, but see, we, d we're Republicans to begin with, and we like putting money back into people's pockets. OK, uh, and, but you do it in a way that has a return on investment, not for the state of West Virginia, but for the people themselves. OK, that is that's one of the reasons why uh, the Senate was a fan of Amendment 2. Uh, and yes, it was defeated. But the fact is, it put money back into everybody's pocket, people and businesses alike, seniors and the working poor. They, they own automobiles. It put money back into their pockets. This personal income tax reduction plan doesn't do that. It puts it in the pocket of the workers, and the more money you make, the more money that's back in your pocket. Seniors are already, we've done it so that they don't pay personal income tax up to $100,000, and then, uh, on their Social Security, excuse me, and excuse me, on their pensions and stuff like that. And then the working poor don't pay any either in this state. Okay, so we've covered the basis on, on, on a lot of that. We've got to do, and, and when I was talking about the personal property tax, that was one that was affordable. We'd had four years of a flatline budget, and we were able to control our spending and made it so that we could do that and had no effects on the future spending. We would have been able to manage that. Uh, this one is a much heavier lift, and your ho it's a big hope for the on the come. Uh, I like how uh, that people are coming up, and they they've got 100% trust of in doing the opposite of what probably should have been done economically. Uh, for, for the people of West Virginia. What we've done since uh, and, uh, we took over in 2015 is nothing less than short of phenomenal. This governor came and wanted to do the largest tax increase in the state's history, and we said no, and we controlled the spending. We're hoping to control it and find greater efficiencies, like the DHHR, but that's been pulling teeth, too, for over a year. Well, Craig, I would argue that fixing roads, bridges, uh, sewers, um I would foster care. I, I would argue that that would benefit people. Oh, I, I don't disagree with you. Okay? I don't disagree with you. But you have people out here that is hammering away, saying that, uh, you know, I need a tax break. I, 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 I want this. The, the governor's wanting this. The House of Delegates is wanting it. It has a bearing on other bills as well. Yes, but so, but we've had how many years in a row of surpluses have we had now? Three. Uh, the, no, actually, uh, when we get to July the first of this year, it'll be four years. Four years. Uh, but they've been they've been growing incrementally, and then the severance tax yeah. is really taken off of. Uh, from that standpoint. Okay. And we've used those surpluses in such a way to do just like what you've talked about, Rob. Right. But but how many, we've had four years of surpluses as of this July coming up, but how many tax cuts have we had passed in four years? Oh, my. Th th there's been those two uh, th that has been out there. We've been looking at where you do, uh, do it. The, 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 it was a three year phase in on the, the reduction for the seniors on, on the personal income tax on that. Veterans. Uh, no tax. Okay, so there, are, there okay. has been work on what we could do and what we could afford. Okay, so that's those are fringe tax, fringe te element tax cuts for seniors and, and for veterans because most people in the state aren't seniors or veterans. I'm going to guess, right? Well, the, 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 we have the largest veteran population in the country. 
Right, but there's 1.8 million people in the state. Are there 900,000 veterans and seniors in the state? No. There's okay. 900,000 taxpayers. Right, so that means the majority of the people aren't, aren't seniors and veterans. Hey, God bless them. They deserve their tax cuts. I'm not telling you that they don't. But I'm saying we have four years of, of surpluses, and we don't have we don't have a single tax cut that affects people in the, in the larger way that you're talking about doing with the House, but we can't come to an agreement to because we, you don't trust their numbers. And they don't think that you guys want to negotiate on the on the, and they're not willing to negotiate on the two okay, percent sales stop tax. There, stop yeah. there. Let's stop there. Yeah. We to, to, to negotiate, you got to be at the table. Okay. You have to be aware of what's going on. Okay. That didn't take place. That so just so your listeners understand on this, that I come in here on Sunday morning, ten of. 1030 before the, the day the Sunday before the session begins and I pull in and the governor's chief of staff's here and Bray Carey's here and I, I, I look at it and think well that's odd because I'm the only guy that's normally here on a Sunday morning working of uh, and so I look over and uh, the, the speaker, Eric Householder, and the finance chair from over there are coming out of the governor's mansion, and the governor's in there. Now, if you want to be able to get things done in this building, ask anybody. Ask Joe Manchin. Ask anybody that's been here before. You bring everybody to the table and work together. That's what took place whenever I became the Senate president, and we worked together. Uh, to be able to get things done, and we were very successful on it. But if you're going to run a two-on-one game, uh, then and and not include men, and then try to bully something across the finish line with numbers that don't work, with numbers that don't work, you're probably not going to have a good end result, and you can't put that on the Senate. Okay, Joe Ferretti. All right, so. <laughs> Senator, here, here's, the, I guess, the dilemma is that uh, we're going to need uh, you and the governor and the House to all get together on this. And that I, I'm hearing there's just right now no consensus on how we're going to cut these taxes. Uh, Jesus, how do you, Joe, <laughs> it, it's day 17 of in a 60-day session, and you're acting like that we should have done something yesterday. When the Democrats ran this place, my friend, nothing got done till day 60. Well, and you're I, sitting I'm, here I'm, acting like it needs to be done today. Well, I would point out that the, I, I think well, I said a fair point because uh, the, the speed <laughs> the speed that the House and the governor acted. Uh, on taxes by getting a bill over to the Senate in a matter of a few days perhaps has given us a false sense of of uh, you know getting something accomplished quickly and I, I so maybe, maybe we should applaud yeah well that's well that's my point Craig when you start indicating uh, to the listeners here that you think the governor and the house have acted irresponsibly uh, you know I, it doesn't give us a lot of hope that something's going to get done no, well, th that's just the point, though, and that is good tax policy is good tax policy regardless. And this is the way this process should work and uh, for, for, by getting everybody to see the table. And we have come back uh, to it, but, uh, again, uh, they, they look at me and tell me that, well, now we've done what you wanted, Craig. Uh, we, want, uh, we did 50%, but it's not 50%, and it has the potential to never be 50%, and that provides zero economic activity for the people of West Virginia. When I say economic activity, I'm talking about jobs. And again, I'll go back to what I said in the beginning of this broadcast, is, is that in the Eastern Panhandle, we're good. We're good. Of uh, The rest of the state, not so much so. We've got to be able to do things to make it so they have job opportunities, gainful employment in the rest of the state. Billy, Craig, as I understand it, at least I think I understand it, the solution to this is to have the 50% uh, personal income tax reduction on year one, up out of, the, out of the gate, year one, that does it. Send that back to the House, and they, they modify theirs to year one, and then it's all done. Is that correct? Uh, yes. That, 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 that's one avenue. Again, we're still early in this, and the Senate, too. I've, I've got, you guys heard the book Unleashing Capitalism? Mm -hmm. 
that by Russ Sobel. Yes. Uh, that's been a greater degree of roadmap to the prosperity that we have right now in West Virginia. And uh, Monday morning from 8.30 to 10.30, uh, the speaker and I are hosting Russ Sobel in a joint caucus. He's coming back to West Virginia from South Carolina, and he's going to be uh, giving the presentation because many people, excuse me, that serve in this legislature don't know who Ross Sobel is. They have no idea on who he is. So he's coming back to have a joint caucus. So when you hear this conversation between us, you get the impression that we're not working together. That's not true either. We are working together on many, many, many fronts. The Speaker and I talk on a daily basis and things like that. And we want the best things, and we want to be able to do the tax reforms. But we don't want to make the mistakes. And this is exactly why you have these conversations and these debates of, on that. And if this was a good idea, we would have been included in the beginning on it. We would be saying it. And guess what? It would already be law. You know, this was a, a similar complaint the governor had when he did his uh, Against Amendment 2 tour back in the fall, in which he said that the House and the Senate got together, they came up with a bunch of stuff. I was never invited to any of the meetings. Uh, what is the deal with the two-thirds triangulation that happens down there in Charleston? Why, why does it always seem the governor and one branch versus the other? I did that <laughs> for you want my <laughs> personal opinion? <laughs> Sure. I, 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 frankly, I think that this is on uh, the governor from that standpoint. He likes uh, doing this. This is a business tactic that he uses in the private sector, and he's never taken time enough to figure out how the, uh, the government works. Okay, let's let's just be honest about it uh, from that standpoint. So he likes pitting people against each other so that he gets what he wants. Okay, and it's. It's, it could very well be the case. But but now, keep in mind, the governor's argument was a false argument uh, on personal property tax. And the reason for it was he talked about it in the state of the state in 2018 to make it a priority, cut taxes and win. Remember? Mm -hmm. 2019 and 2020, but yet comes out and opposes it when it's on the ballot. And the legislature had gotten across the finish line what they he wanted to do, and then he didn't want it done. Hey, and I want to go back on one comment that you made that we were holding the Senate accountable for all this. And, and just so you know, uh, the frustration over the tax cut situation, the stalemate that it's in, is not directed solely at the Senate. It's at all three branches because at all points along the way since these things have been discussed, all three have failed to deliver tax relief to the vast majority of West Virginians. Yeah, and I understand that. I, but right now, to, to, uh, you have to understand that I get emails saying, don't, don't do this tax. Then I get emails telling me, do do it. I get phone calls. I get people stopping me on the street. You know the drill on that. So what happens is when you live in this fish tank, you become a little bit sensitive to it. And, and the ball's in our court right now. Okay? So that, that adds to it as well. But you know what? This is exactly why the founding fathers had a set our set the government up the way it is so that it is a contrast it is to where to debate and only the very best can actually come out in the end and it saved it to save us from ourselves and, and and tyrants for that matter in this country so even though the process that could that's, there's a reason why they call it the sausage mill Okay, uh, but, but but there's a reason why it's a confrontational process, and but when it's all over and done with, most of the time we get fairly decent products, and we're way more efficient in getting things done in this state than what most other states, and clearly the federal government. I know you have to go. I appreciate your time this morning. Any final words? Oh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we're getting ready to go on the floor here today. I think I'd pay attention to uh, the next couple of weeks. Uh, if anybody that would believe that uh, we're not working to get things done on a multitude of fronts is misinformed. Uh, that, that's, 
the Senate and the House and, and even the governor. There's a lot of good things that's taking place. Uh, it's just a matter Sometimes it's just better to have no money at all. There's nothing to fight over. And when I started the flatline budget four years ago, I laughed because I told some people, I said, you know, if I'm successful on what this is going to do, we're going to be fighting over tax reductions. Okay? And here we are. Here we are, and it's a good problem to have to be having the discussion of, uh, over tax reductions for the people of West Virginia because their government has been managed in a way that allows that to happen. So regardless of what takes place, that things are better than what they were just a few short years ago. Craig, thank you for your time this morning. Always appreciate it. Thanks, Craig. You're welcome. Thank you, Craig. Senate President Craig Blair 